vintage sand. Hello, hello, hello. Hey guys, it's our 25th episode, our silver anniversary episode. Da, 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 da. And they said it wouldn't last. And here we are still, <laughs> bloodied and unbroken. We are Team Vintage Sand. That would be Michael Edmund, John Meyer, and yours truly, Josh Cabot, returning for our 25th episode on this election eve. So what do you get, what do you get for someone for a 25th podcast? Is there, uh, how about a new president? That would be nice. That would be nice. That would be very not, nice. Not that we're letting our politics slip here, but it slip in here. But it was a very clever way of getting to our main topic, which is we are discussing today uh, our. And Joe Biden is sort of silver looking, so. Yeah, very distinguished. And uh, Maya Rudolph does a great Kamala Harris on Saturday Night Live, so um, we'll have we'll have. I don't care for Jim Carrey's. Um, no, I kind of like Woody Harrelson's better. Actually. Yeah, Jim Carrey is too manic. He'll Biden is in that manic. And yet, you know, you give Jim Carrey some good material like Truman Show or Eternal oh, yeah. Sunshine, and he's shockingly brilliant. Yeah, he was great in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless I Mind. Just, brilliant. I, just, I just said that. You know what? I'm going to have to erase your memory of that moment and we'll have to do it again. But see what I did there, John? But uh, yeah, it's an Eternal Sunshine joke. So our topic today is the best American political films. And you know, I used to be a debate coach uh, in when I uh, taught English in the city. And so first thing you got to do in a debate, although not this is a debate, is define terms. So what do we mean by a political film? I think the interesting and problematic, but ultimately interesting thing about it is that almost every film is in some way political. There are many different ways to approach this. So the first one is thinking of, you know, there are films made directly about American politics, but I was trying to think of how many, I mean, Lincoln, obviously, um, but how many times are there films, Nixon, you know, Stone's Nixon and Stone's W about Bush, Presidents appearing in films. Not themselves, but characters playing them. I mean... Okay, you mean playing real presidents or fictitious? Playing real presidents. Oh, wow, well... Right, see, it's, I was thinking, and it's not really that many. No, especially in older movies, there was always sort of like a, a reverence, like you only showed the president, like, for a moment, like from a uh, from behind or something like that, or or it would be even though an important character, it would be only for a moment kind of thing. Right. I mean, you know, I thought Ulysses Grant shows up as a major character in Wild Wild West, but that's hardly something <laughs> to hang well, that on there. <laughs> well, there was a recent Bill Murray. Um, oh, the FDR one. About yes, the FDR, FDR one. FDR, yes. yes. Yeah. Which yeah. I didn't particularly like. And then uh, there was that uh, wonderful two movies, two two-parter uh, TV movie in the seventies, uh, Eleanor and Franklin. Right, and with Edward Hurley. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that and was Jane Alexander. That who, was excellent. Who's the, today this day? I still think is the best Eleanor Roosevelt I've ever seen. Yeah, I, and he was great too. And he and was Woody great Roosevelt. too. Yeah. And he played him in Annie. I know, I know. I remember That's seeing right. the, the trailer for that, and I said to a friend, he's being typecast as Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. Right, in John Huston's Annie. That's right. He comes along at the end and uh, That's makes right. Well, it, it's sing. from the play. There's a Roosevelt character in the play as well. Well, and you have, as you say, presidents making cameo appearances. You had uh, Tom Wilkinson did a passable job as LBJ in uh, Selma, I yeah. thought. Yes, yeah. Uh, John Quincy Adams shows up in the person of Anthony Hopkins in uh, Amistad, although he's uh, ex-president at that point. That's right. That's right. an underrated film. I like Amistad. That's a good movie. Yeah, yeah it's I a good could, movie. I think it's one of Spielberg's better movies. Yeah, I think, and that's a, certainly an explicitly political It's film. actually, that's, uh, that's a movie that's used in, uh, in classes now, in schools. Should be. Yep. No, but yeah, absolutely, because the sequel, you know, the best thing about it is the middle passage sequence, which may be the best and most painful in a good way, or in, in, a, in a way to stimulate discussion, depiction of what the middle passage was like, what conditions were like on those yeah. passages. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good recommend. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, so you have films that feature actual real politicians and some that are, you know, fictionalized versions of real politicians. So you have all the King's Men, you know, which is loosely based on Huey Long's story, and you have, I guess, well, what, what, I go, oh, uh, Primary Colors. Which I'm doing. 
That's right. one of the films. So, all right, so we'll leave that, you know, which I'm is doing, a, yeah. a, a Clinton thing. Which and I just watched this afternoon. <laughs> there, so that's one kind of political movie that are about specific politicians, you know, obviously. Well, oh, Primary they, Colors is disguised. Right, but then- Not we, Bill Clinton. Right, yeah. not Bill Clinton. Although um, he does a Bill Clinton character. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't do it as well as Daryl Hammond does, but you know what I love about Daryl Hammond's invitation <laughs> is the biting the thumb, biting the lip and the thumb thing. I feel the yeah. pain. Yeah. <laughs> so there we go. Um, some films are political in the sense that they talk about our political system, uh, like advise the consent or- Which I'm also doing. Yes. Right. Oh, so I'll be quiet about it. Uh, seven <laughs> days in May, you know, about the possible what might go wrong right. with our political system. Mr. Smith, I guess. Yeah, yeah. which I'm not doing. You know, right. I, I thought think, of it. Go ahead. Mike. I just don't like it very much. I think I think it's a good movie. I think there's good performances in it, but it's some of it has has dated. I like Badly. I like the side performances. I like Edward Arnold. I love Gene Arthur. Yeah. I love, um, love yeah. Claude Rains, especially. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I even like Thomas Mitchell. And he's yeah, Thomas Mitchell's good in it, too, and sometimes he's such a ham. Yeah, exactly. Um, and although I, you know, personally, I think the best film ever made our political process is the I'm Just a Bill Schoolhouse Rock uh, episode. I don't know if you guys, you guys are probably too old for that, but I am uh, strictly a schoolhouse rock age person and I'm just, to ask anyone my age about I'm just a Bill and they'll sing the whole thing for you, so. I've never seen it, I'm sorry. And then, of oh, so an, a yet another variety of course is satire, most famously being a film like Strange Love or Duck Soup or The Great McGinty or yeah. Wag the Dog in the Loop, any of those films would qualify. And are you guys mentioning any of those? Well, that, those are sort of on my honorable mentions. All right, good. And then there are sort of the straightforward sort of comedies slash dramas, films like The American President, you know, Aaron, Jaron Sorkin wrote. It was sort of a yeah. blueprint for West Wing. Um, Frost Nixon, uh, Absolute Power, Eastwood's film with Gene Hackman, sort of a thriller set in, uh, yeah. in yeah. the you know, White House, which was quite good. And of course, you knew I was going to bring this up. There are genre films, specifically, I'm thinking horror and science fiction, that use that cover to be explicitly political. I think of the zombies crashing through the shopping mall in Dawn of the Dead that Romero did in 75. And if that's not an attack on, on US capitalism, I don't know what is, but it's very beautifully done. Um, and Jordan Peele's films are like that too. I mean, is there a is there a better yeah. film about the politics of cultural appropriation than Get Out? And, or us, both of them are. are a, lot, a lot of the like so-called science fiction horror films of the 50s were metaphorically political, either doing with like the Red Scare or some other exactly. issue. Exactly, um, exactly. Um, I was going to The, the Thing, the thing for the Howard Hawks, The Thing is like that. Right, and Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Absolutely. Is, yes. is, yeah. is, so, and science fiction is often used, you know, because you sort of couch the blow by setting it in the future. So you have a Ray Bradbury who can make, right. you know, strong political points in, in Fahrenheit 451, although Truffaut blew the movie completely. But that's a whole other episode. Have you guys seen the movie of it? Yes. Oof. Yeah. Which one? Fahrenheit I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it in a very long time. I saw it when so, it came out. Yeah, not a few. Well, I was in love with Julie to, Christie. It used to so. show quite often, and now it's kind of disappeared. Never. I haven't seen it on TV. In... So um, we, are, we are all going to take very uh, different approaches to this, um, although we're going to go around in sort of top five fashion. But don't really think of this as a ranking. It's just films that we think embody a certain uh, ideal about or negative view in my case most of them turn up negative about the american spirit i mean <clears throat> excuse me we uh for time's sake we're gonna keep it strictly to american because my goodness we could just do a whole episode on this with bong joon ho i mean has there been a better political allegory than parasite ever made um, I, I don't think so snow there which is snow piercer is sort of an, another allegory about social class and okja is sort of a uh, a fable or a parable about environmentalism so bong has been dealing with that stuff for a while but just for time's sake we're going to limit it to 
American directors and American films. And I'm really excited about this. And it's our election eve special, our 20th anniversary. So let's dive right in. Mike, why don't you kick it off? What's, what's first on your list? Okay, I'm doing this chronologically and it's gonna cover 50 years. Perfect. And uh, the first uh, film is from 1948, State of the Union. Nice, uh, direct, great script. Directed by Frank Capra and uh, from the play by Howard Lindsay and Russell Krauss. And actually it won the Pulitzer Prize, the play, uh, for drama in 1946. And it's never been revived since, understandably, because it is a very topical year. Um, it, the beginning of the film centers around a young publisher of her late father's newspaper, a woman named Kay Thorndike and how she conspires with an out of, uh, out of favor Republican hack to push a businessman, a guy named Grant Matthews, towards the Republican nomination of 1948. This is one of the few films that actually names the party because Republicans had been out of, uh, out yeah. of the White House now yeah. for uh, uh, 16 years, uh, yeah. four terms, yeah, four, uh, 16 years. Um, Truman was in because uh, he took over from Roosevelt when he died in 45. Anyway, the, the, the story, this Matthews is this rich, wealthy businessman. He owns, he pilots his own plane and he owns a whole bunch of aer aerodynamic businesses. And in the meantime, he's having an affair with the publisher. Um, he's separated from his wife. And uh, so there are several kind of stories going on. Uh, the relationship between husband and wife who are estranged, but quote, still love each other. And then the relationship between Grant Matthews and his mistress. But the mistress is really not so interested in, in him as a man. He, she's interested in him as a way of getting into being uh, powerful in the Republican Party. Right. It's parts of it are very, very funny. Parts of it are kind of a cousin to the candidate, where you see the candidate being manipulated into softening his stances, although we really don't hear the stances that that hard. It's it's uh, supposedly he's pro labor and pro business, but he thinks that both have to um compromise. So is it about the campaign? I haven't seen it in ages. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, it's about the, it, it starts with talking him into running and then uh, talking uh, and him talking his wife into going along with it because they are separated. And then they do uh, visit uh, several cities, although they know you, you don't really see any primaries. And ah. then it, it all accumulates into a night where he's at home with all these politicians and all the p people from his uh, neighborhood uh, doing a radio broadcast. The, ra the line, I'm paying for this broadcast was, by the way, was stolen by Ronald Reagan in 1980 from this film. Spencer Tracy says this towards the end of the film when they try to cut him off. But as good as Tracy is, and he usually is always good, this movie, I think, belongs to the two women. Uh, Catherine Hepburn. Uh, of course. Who was, believe it or not, hired over the weekend before they were shooting. It was supposed to have been Claudette Colbert. Ew. And Colbert Ew. told um, I don't see that. Uh, uh, Frank Capra that she didn't want to work past five o'clock. And, and over the weekend, uh, apparently, um, Capra fired her. And Hepburn was ready to go on day one. <laughs> Of course. And she is yeah, great. Yeah, she is. She's excellent. She's really, really I have good. I I have friends who say they don't like Katherine Hepburn, you know, because they they see her, you know, in on Golden Pond and, and then they see this film and go, Hey, she was really good. <laughs> but Mike, you're my and she is terrific in it. Um, uh, and then there's yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then there's Angela Lansbury. This oh. is her eighth film. She's only twenty-two. Ridiculous. She's the mistress of Spencer Tracy, who's 48. Not once do you think, ew. Yeah. Uh, well, because, as you said, uh, as you said in, when we were talking once about Manchurian Candidate, Mike, that he always played older. 
She always seemed older than she, she always. She always older. played yeah. older, right? But she's only twenty-two in this. It, it, it's yeah. incredible, and uh, she almost steals the film. I mean, nobody really steals the film, but she is so good in this. Uh, Van, a political columnist who's supposed to watch Tracy to make sure he doesn't stray from the party line. Adolf Manju. Yay. Uh, plays the, the political hack. And uh, apparently during filming, uh, yeah. he was naming names. And apparently he and Hep Hepburn sure. loathed each other. Because uh, apparently he was naming people that Hepburn happened to have liked. Eek. And uh, was threatening to name her. I don't know exactly what happened. What, could he, what was he going to name her about? Oh, who knows? They would name it for, you know, um, for anything. I think it's one of Capra's best the, movies. Partly, he just, there's something about the script, maybe because he was working from a play, it just seems to keep him in tighter control. It doesn't have all those, all those overdone Capra-esque embellishments yeah, in it. It isn't really preachy. And also, well, as, no, as, as not. pointed out, the, um, the populism of Capra also often can become very close, like in New John Doe, to, to almost a kind of fascism. Uh, it gets a little, I, I, I don't think he ever really nails that yeah. populist yeah. thing correctly. So I think John's right. I think it is that he's working from a, a well-written play kind of reins him in a little bit. So, um, right, so state and then there's also in the movie, besides those things, there's the rivalry between the two women. And that's intense. Even though they only have a scene at the end, it's... It, 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 with movies, I would definitely have this on there because it does show politics at that time. It's really almost an, an historical document. Interesting. And it was such an interesting time for, for politics. Yeah, um, I don't know how well it did, but... So Mike's number five is, is again, not ranking, is, uh, is, is State of the Union. I'm going to take, I'm taking sort of the Great Gatsby path on that. And by this, I mean, I'm going to be talking about films that are not explicitly about politics or the political process, but say something about the American soul, for lack of a better word, about American culture, and are often very daring and very ahead of their time in showing sort of the darker side of the American dream. And so I'm going to start with a film that finally is starting to get its due, that was hated when it came out, um, and has, is, is, is now in the Library of Congress's list. It's a film that not many people have gotten to see, but more and more are starting to, and that's Leo McCarry's Make Way for Tomorrow from 1937. And in fact, McCarry won the Best Director Oscar that year for The Awful Truth, which is, you know, fantastic, Cary Grant and Irene Dunn. And when he got up there, he said, I thank you for this. You gave it to me for the wrong movie. And I, I have to say that, you know, well, it is probably the best American film ever made about aging. And when I say aging, there have been tons of films, especially recently, made about the physical damage that aging does and the emotional pain that causes, like Amour, Hanukkah's Amour, like um, Away From Her, the Julie Christie one, Mike, I know you're a big Julie Christie fan, like Still Alice, you know, the uh, one that Julianne Moore was nominated for, both sort of early onset to but, but there are no other American movies. <laughs> there are no other American movies that I can think of that are about aging and the social and economic value that we put on older people. And basically, just very quickly, the story of Make Way for Tomorrow, it's an older couple played by Victor Moore and Beulah Bondi. Uh, it's the Depression, it's 1936. Their health, their health is fine, but they, they can't afford, he's out of work, he can't get a new job because of the Depression. And they have four kids, three of them who live close by, one out in California, and the kids will not take them in. And they sort of keep each other going and, and they try to figure out a way to do this. And the kids say, we can only take one of you. So one of them goes to live with one of the children, another one goes to another, and they find all these excuses to eventually, you know, they try to put the mom in a home and it, it's just, and they realize that they have to separate. There's no way they can stay together not because of health, but because of the economic conditions at the time and because 
of what we do to older people in this country. We warehouse them. And so the last, on the last, their last day together, they have this wonderful you know, series of scenes where they go out together for one last time, knowing it's probably going to be the last time. And they're always hopeful. They say, you know, well, we'll figure it out. We'll find a way to we'll be together someday. But you never feel like they are. And the last scene is their goodbye at Grand Central Station. And it is one of the most, I always cry when I see it. And it earns its tears, honestly. It's not manipulative. The, what I love about the film is the tone is very straightforward, very unsentimental, just painting this picture. And yes, it's about this family. And yes, even the kids say about themselves, we're pretty awful, aren't we? I think, I think it's, I mean, look, we judge a society by how well it treats its most vulnerable. And that's what makes this film political because we don't treat our elderly well, and that was in 1937, and we still don't. Look at the COVID statistics, if you don't believe me. I mean, nothing points out our attitude towards the elderly yeah. better than the percentage of people who've died from COVID who are in horrible nursing care facilities. It, for, for my money, there's only one other film like it that even comes yeah. close to telling the story, and that's Tokyo Story. That's Ozu's Tokyo Story. But at least the parents are still together. I, that's what I was thinking. Of. That's what I thought yeah. of. When and I and thought. I've read in several places that Ozu used "Make Way for Tomorrow" as a uh, as an inspiration. So my my last word on it is that you know we talk about Sunset Boulevard as a film about how Hollywood just chews up people and spits them out when it uses them up and doesn't need them anymore. To me, "Make Way for Tomorrow" is a film that that points the finger squarely at us as a society and says, we do this to all older people, you know? And I, I just find it incredibly powerful. And it, it's, it's a real indictment of how badly we treat some of our most vulnerable citizens, in this case, the elderly, and you know, who deserve it so little, and yet their care is so bad. Have you guys seen it? I, you know, yes. I have seen it, but it's been a very, very long time since I've seen it. I can't remember the last time it was showing anywhere. Interesting. It's I out saw it on TCM a few years ago. It's, it's, it's good. It's, it's beautiful. It's out on Criterion, and they, they think highly of it. And I, it, as I said, Library of Congress put it, put it on its register, and it's the only film ever made in this country, I think, that's like that in its focus on the elderly. So that's, that's, my, uh, that's my number five. John Meyer, tee it up. Okay, my first one is The Contender, 2000, uh, written and directed by Rod Lurie with Joan Allen, yes, Jeff Bridges, coming. Gary Oldman, yeah. and Christian Slater, which is just a, and is a political issue, but it's very, very entertaining. Uh, Jeff Bridges plays a, a president who's in his second term. He's sort of on his way out and his vice president has died. He has to appoint a new vice president and he decides he wants to do something, you know, important as sort of support his legacy, his swan song. And he, you know, is adamant about choosing a woman and Joan Allen is the, the person he chooses and there's a sex scandal from her past that's uncovered which makes her uh, confirmation very difficult uh, like Gary Oldman's the bad guy here right Gary Oldman's a uh, Rican who's heading the hearing and he's particularly hard on her and it's, yeah. Right. yeah yeah yes yep and there's sort of a side story of an investigation going on but you're not quite sure who they're investigating and you find out at the end, and the thing is at the very beginning, uh, there's a car accident and a would-be wannabe vice president dives in to try to save the president. They say, well, no, we can't because this, this situation is just, you know, chock full of problems. It's going to call up Chaplin Quiddick. He said, but, but I didn't do anything wrong. And I said, but no, 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 it's too many problems. So that's when they decide they're gonna choose Joan Allen. And the real crux of it is that sh her issue is that it's her private life and she says it should have nothing to do with my political life, my profession, and I'm not gonna answer those questions. What I mo most remember about The Contender is that Jeff Bridges as the president loved to eat. 
<laughs> yes. There's a lot, of, a lot of humor. A lot of humor in the movie. <laughs> that was one of the funniest things throughout the whole movie because he's always trying to fool the chef. He said, yeah. what can I come up with to stump him? And finally, at the end, he does, and it's something that uh, I don't want to give it away, but that's very funny. I remember that. I've only seen it once, but I remember that distinctly. And it has, uh, it has a, rousing, a rousing ending. Yeah. What happened to Joan Allen? She's fantastic. She still works on stage, and she shows up in movies occasionally. Um, there, yeah, there uh, was that period she was working a lot. And yeah. I mean, kind of tapered off. And she's going to turn up again in another movie I mentioned. Very nice. All right, Michael, your next one. Oh, my next one. Yes, uh, we go um, another 14 years to 1962. And this is Advise and Consent, directed by Otto Preminger. Brilliant. With a screenplay by Wendell Mays from the novel by Alan Drury. Now, this, this film is about the Senate, really. It concerns the nomination of a controversial Secretary of State, Bob Leffingwell. The previous Secretary has died, and the President, who's dying himself, there are indications that he's not well, nominated Leffingwell. Now, he's con Leffingwell is controversial because he favors detente with the Russians. Leffingwell's nomination is opposed by the senior Senator of the President's own party, Sieb Cooley, don't you love these names? <laughs> the majority leader has to get the nomination through despite the objections of Cooley and most of the senators from the minority party. Now the party is not named, but it is presumed that the Democrats are the majority and the Republicans are the minority party. Now to, in third, the first third of the film, Leffingwell is accused of belonging to a communist cell when he was teaching at a Midwestern college. And then the chairman of the committee where the nomination has to go through is being blackmailed by unknowns for having a gay affair in the army. And basically the horse trading leads to the final vote in the Senate. Now what's really unusual about this movie is it comes from a book that was a huge bestseller, but it was very right wing and anti-communist in tone. And uh, the, uh, Wendell Mays, who did the screenplay, he worked for Pre Preminger before he did the adaptation of uh, Anatomy of a Murder. And then he would later work with him a few years later in, uh, in Harm's Way. Uh, takes a much more nuanced view than uh, Drury did. And the characters tend to be far more multidimensional than the book's character. For instance, in the movie, Leffingwell is seen as a thoughtful man who thinks that the reflective anti-communism is just a throwaway to the past. Um, but in the book, he's just seen as manipulative and devious. On the other hand, Sieb Cooley is seen as a somewhat devious, is seen as somewhat devious in the movie, planning anon anonymous telegrams to other senators with damaging information on Leffingwell without getting his fingerprints on it. And in the book, he's just seen as an eccentric hero. The cast, is very, very well done. It's a huge cast. Henry yeah. Fonda plays the relatively small part of Reffing Will as only a noble Henry Fonda can do. I know. He has such a, it's a small part, but he just like you remember him throughout the rest of the movie. Yeah, of course. And he is top <laughs> billing and he should be. Uh, Franchot Tone is the president and he's yes. quite good. This is towards the end of his life. Uh, Lou Ayers is the vice president. Walter Pidgeon is the majority leader. Paul Ford is the majority whip. Don Murray is the blackmailed senator. And then George Grizzard, Will Gear, Peter Lawford, and Betty White show up as other senators. Uh, Gene Tierney has a small role as the Washington hostess. And Burgess Meredith has a, plays a witness out to destroy Leffingwell. But my favorite performance in the film is Charles Lawton <laughs> as Seb Cooley. This is his final film. He would die the following year of cancer. Right. And he must have studied Southern uh, politicians really well because he seems to get everything right. The courteousness of the Southern genteel mixed with the ruthlessness. And he, he's just really, really wonderful in it. There's one other thing that uh, Preminger, I know, must have done deliberately. One of the senators in the film, and I was just noticing it just this time because I was watching it again for this broadcast, 
One of the senators who doesn't have any lines is Afro-American. And at the time of the filming, there had not been a popularly elected Afro-American to the Senate. Right. Uh, that, that sounds it good. It hadn't been done right. since, until 1966 uh, 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 with uh, Edward Brooke of Massachusetts. Right, from Massachusetts, I remember, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I, I just thought that was a, like, like a little bit of Preminger getting his, possibly getting his politics in there, because 1962, there's all this civil rights, and it was like, ah, why not have an Afro-American senator? Yeah, I, well, I'm sure. <laughs> but yeah. you really do learn a lot about the Senate. You learn what the vice president's role is and, the, the, you know, the filibustering. And it's a very entertaining film, far, far, far superior to the book. It's a great cast. Yeah, and it's a great cast. cast. Yeah. And Preminger, and it's, I don't think it did very well. I, it's never considered one of Preminger's major films, and uh, I don't know why. Yeah, I like some of Preminger's. You know I'm a big Bunny Lake fan. Um, yeah. But Have Preminger's, you seen Advice and Consent? Yes. Oh, yeah. Huh. No, fantastic. I mean, you know, and he always got the best out of his actors. And, 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 and yeah, it's, it's very hard to make the procedural stuff interesting and I, I think advising yeah. consent succeeds in yeah that. it's very it's very entertaining very well acted and as you said you really do learn something about how the senate works how they work for and against each other the whole process it's it's a good movie yeah i have a question with did the best man come out before or after advice and consent after i think best best man best was, man yeah 64 64 yeah henry fonda again right yeah, I know, I know, because it's almost as if, I know, it's almost as if it's the same part. <laughs> no, and he was the president in Failsafe also. In yeah, Singapore, that's right. right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's perfect in Failsafe. Perfect. Uh, it, were it not for Strangelove, Failsafe would be much better known. It's a fantastic film. It is, yeah. but I can only, I've only watched it oh. once. It's just too, too much of a it is, thing. Yeah, it's, it's so depressing. <laughs> Funny how we thought nuclear war was going to be the thing that got us. Well... Maybe not. Um, so my, my number four is uh, a film by a young director in 1941 named uh, Orson Welles. And uh, you may have heard of it. It was originally called, and this is critical to my thesis here, it was originally called American, just American, before they changed the name to Citizen Kane. And one, you tend not to think of Citizen Kane as a political film, but I think it is. I think it's in the same way that Make Way for Tomorrow is. I think it's a very powerful, not indictment, because it sort of lets us draw our own conclusions, but of, of to me, it and The Great Gatsby are the two great works of art that show sort of the dark underbelly of the American dream and how empty it really is. Um, and I think the fact that Hearst, that Hearst, that Mankiewicz and Wells originally wanted to call it American indicated that they were trying to say something, not just about the William Randolph Hearst character that becomes Charlie Kane, but also about <laughs> who he is in that society. I mean, he lives a life that most Americans dream of, but he never gets what he really wants, as everyone points out. Uh, and as Susie points out to him in the tent, you know, he's incapable of giving any love either. Uh, he, you know, as, uh, as Jed Leland says, he, he just let, he never gave away anything. He just left you a tip, right? And, you know, there's so much of the film that, that is in its own way political. Thatcher, you know, sort of representing the Wall Street, you know, and how terrifying he is to little Charlie. And that's, those are the, the Wall Street trust-based capitalism. And it's, you know, I watch that now and I think, yeah, we're right back to that, aren't we? I know it's, it was still it's still that whole thing about me. He says says you know this whole this whole thing with the oil barrels, blah blah blah, oil crisis. You know, it's it's the same thing still going on about how big realize, business has its hand in politics, manipulating things. What you don't realize, John Myers, is that you're talking to two people. You're talking to Josh Cabot podcast. No, <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> and I love and I love that 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 bit. You know, as as yeah. uh, as I, I, I will donate a thousand dollars to that committee. Charlie, Charlie Kane should be uh, put in prison or whatever. Um, and, and, Josh, you know, can you answer a question for me, yeah. Citizen Kane? Why do your students dislike it? Because it, they find it hard to follow and they don't love black and white. And as John, as both of you have pointed out over the course of the podcast, 
long takes are really hard for them. They're yeah. just not used to it. They're used to rat-a-tat-tat, machine gun, paste editing, and this is just, they don't know what to do. But you say they like Ace in the Hole, not some uh, black and white. Yeah, but Ace in the Hole moves a little faster. And the writing is... Well, is, Kane, Kane does move fast, but yeah. yes, it is those long, those long takes, and they did it purposely because he had theatrically trained actors who knew, he knew to be able to do those sustained kind of performances. What's really beautiful, though, to watch the movie is, is the camera work where, you know, there's that setup to have the, the deep focus and the scene will be playing. And unless you're really, really watching for it, you don't realize the camera's moving and instead of cutting to a close up, it's slowly moving in a way that's very, very subtle so that just at the right moment, there is a close up. Yeah, and you know, everyone talks about Wells and, and, and Greg Tolan inventing that. Not really, because if you watch Rules of the Game, um, that happens all over Rules of the yeah. Game. But I, think, but I think Wells kind of perfected it. But, you know, there is, of course, explicit politics in Kane. There's Gettys, yeah. you know, who's sort of the classic machine politician. And it's odd that in the end, you kind of, I don't say, want to say feel sorry for Gettys, but Gettys is not the villain that he should be. You know, when he says to Kane, you're, you're, you're going to get a lesson that's coming. You're going to need a lesson. You're going to need more than one lesson. More than one lesson. And yeah, yeah and you're going to get more than one lesson too. And so it's interesting that the machine hack is not the bad guy here. And I'm not saying he's a good guy. Um, and of course, you were talking about uh, in State of the Union, Mike marrying in. You know, not for nothing. He certainly doesn't marry Emily uh, for for love. It doesn't hurt that she's the president's niece. Niece, exactly. Right? And ben Bernstein says, "President's niece. Someday she'll be a president's wife." And they all wave yeah. out the window in that yeah. Movie. Yeah. You know, annoying scene. Um, but I was thinking, you know, it's He's it, still it, it, Uncle John. <laughs> I'm exactly. He's still the president of the United States, John. That's yes, what he's they still call. Uncle John. <laughs> right. He's still a well-meaning fool. Yeah, we could, we could, in one, one episode, we just have to act out Citizen Kane from memory. Yeah, I know, I know <laughs> all the lines. I think but, I do too. But <laughs> I thought, I was thinking that, um, I, I turned on to it the other day, uh, and it was the scene after Susie's debut at the Chicago Opera, where uh, he's, he's fired Jed, and he get, Jed sends him, uh, the, the ripped up check, but also declaration that, that, of principles. That declaration of principles. And boy, it feels that uh, maybe this is make, being too English teacher about it, but it seems like what this country has done. We, he, remember, he tears it up and she's, you know, she screeches at him, what's that? And he says, an antique. I mean, we have, it feels to me, at least from my political position, in a lot of ways that we have all, as a nation, kind of torn up our declaration of principles. And those of us who haven't actively been ripping have, have, you know, there are a lot of people out there trying to stop it and restore us to who we were, but our principles are, are kind of out the window. And I think ultimately, Kane is sort of the embodiment of the idea that we are taught as Americans to love things and use people. It's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. And, you know, there was a, a piece by, in the uh, Atlantic about their, their happiness column. It was brilliant. It said, take that phrase and reverse it if you want to be happy. Use things, love people. But Charlie, as we find out, is just, for whatever reason, the separation from his mother, whatever it is, is incapable of love. And it's, and he's living that dream, though. But look what yeah, the it's, 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 it touches on that whole idea, and Gatsby does too, which and I presume that's why you call it the Gatsby thing when we were talking earlier, that all the success and fame and money is not going to fill or heal, you know, a really bad emotional scar from your childhood. Exactly. Maybe it not. makes you feel a little bit better temporarily, but it's, it's not going to fix it. But as a nation, we train our kids to be consumers. Yeah. You know, I'm saying this as yes. an educator. I, I, uh, I and a lot of the good educators I know fight against that, but we raise our kids basically to be good consumers. And then building on what you're saying, John, then we're shocked. Shocked to find that the stuff that we acquire doesn't make us happy, doesn't fill the hole, as you say. Yeah. So to me, it is as... 
subtle and sound an indictment of the American dream as Great Gatsby is in, in book form. And I, I think that, you know, obviously poli a political small p is only one lens to look through one of the great movies ever made. But I think in its own way, Citizen Kane is very political and very, I don't want to say cynical, but realistic about this culture and what we do to ourselves and to others. Are you with me on that or, or, or am I? Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah no, I, I agree. And, but anyone that's not seen the movie, let's emphasize the movie is very entertaining. Yes. It's, I'm quoting Pauline Kael. It is more fun than any other great movie that's ever been made. You know, it is a fun movie. And I, yeah. I, I saw it at, when I, on TV when I was like 10 or 11 and I, I had no trouble following it. And I wasn't that smart a kid. It may, look, it may be a, a stretch to interpret Kane through a political lens, but no, I it, don't think I don't think so. I I I think it is political. It's not just about Charlie Kane, anyway. No. Yeah. Yes. And to me, it's also embodied. I just want to jump into the film and tell Bernstein, you know, when he's back on the Jersey City Ferry, eighteen ninety six, to go talk to that girl. <laughs> and um, with the parasol yeah. she had. And yeah. I think that also, you know, he chooses money and things and over love. And that is, that's my favorite scene in the movie is, is Everett Sloan and that, mon and you see the reflected Bernstein in the desk, the other Bernstein that might have been. Yeah, and yeah, you definitely get the feeling that Bernstein's not a happy man. Success, my God, he's chairman of the board of Kane Enterprises or whatever. You couldn't be- I have a lot of time. <laughs> I got nothing but time. I'm chairman of the board. Is so, anybody happy in that movie? That's any, a, is anyone? Good question. I don't know. I don't maybe know. the reporter, maybe. But a lot of people who are very rich- never see. A lot of people who are very rich and very powerful, though. But, and, mm -hmm. I, don't, and, I, and I think those two things, that there's very little happiness and a whole lot of money and power- kind of go, go along together with each other and nicely sum up what is political about this film. John, what about you? What you got next? Uh, my next movie is The Front, 1976, uh -huh. directed by Martin Ritt, written by Walter Bernstein, who was blacklisted. Yes, and indeed. it's the movie dealing with the blacklist of the late 40s, early 50s, which unfortunately carried over through the whole decade. Um, with Woody Allen, Zero Mostel, Michael Murphy, Herschel Bernardi, who was blacklisted. Andre Andrea Makovici is uh, the so-called love interest in it, but she's a very idealistic woman. Um, Woody Allen plays a cashier in a restaurant. He's also a small-time bookie, and he's friends with Michael Murphy, who is a writer, and he Michael Murphy is blacklisted. So he approaches Woody Allen to front for him, meaning if I put your name on what I write, will you go and bring it to the TV station to sell? And it uh, turns out that uh, the first time it pretty much works and um, he keeps producing these scripts and Woody Allen keeps pushing them off as his own and eventually Woody Allen, uh, he becomes famous as this great writer for TV Meanwhile, all these other writers are giving him all the scripts and everything. They're amazed about how much, you know, all this stuff that he's writing. And also he becomes involved with uh, Andrea Marcovici and she's very idealistic. And the thing is that the Woody Allen character starts to become conscience stricken as the uh, saying goes. And he's especially upset when Zero Mostel hangs himself because uh, he's blacklisted and he can't get, he can't get any work. And uh, he's upset and he starts to really, really think about what he's doing. And uh, so it's, 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 it's a movie that's dealing with two things, about a crisis of conscience, but also about the blacklist and how horrible it was. Yeah, and we should, admit, we should also mention Guilty by Suspicion, the one with De Niro that took slightly yeah, more yes, serious. Yes. And also the recent uh, biopic about Trumbo, Trumbo. with uh, Brian Houston. Yes. Yeah, good movie. Yeah. Good movie. Yeah. It's, yeah, the front, is, you know, films that Woody acts in but doesn't direct are few and far between, and that's an underrated film. Very underrated. And, and Martin Ritten was, was also someone who was blacklisted. And Mostel as well. Yes, and Zero Mostel. 
Yep. Yeah. Sure. Actually, his blacklisting turned out to be, in his case, kind of a blessing. Because he, he got a had a great stage career. He really did have a, and he might not have had that great stage career if he hadn't been basically thrown out of B movies. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's definitely one to look up if you haven't seen it. Is is the front and uh, I, Woody's actually not bad in it. Would yeah, you- he's good in it, yeah. and that, I think that's probably has a lot to do with Martin Ritt because Martin Ritt was always very very good with actors. Yes, a great director of actors. Yep, from 1976, that's the front. Michael, what's your third film? Well, the next is The Best Man, and actually, there's a little bit of connection with the front, but I'll explain that at the very end of my uh, presentation here. Best Man, directed by Franklin uh, Schaffner. Mm. Uh, So only his third film. He'd been uh, directing a lot in TV, but this is only his third uh, feature length film. Screenplay by Gore Vidal based on his play. Now this takes place it's from 1964. It takes place in the 1964 political convention in Los Angeles. The party isn't named. There are two leading candidates for the presidential nomination. One is Ma- William Russell, who is modeled after Adlai Stevenson, a former Secretary of State. Presumably, he had never held a political office. His uh, closest rival is Joe Cantwell a senator modeled after Joe McCarthy and Richard Nixon and looks a little bit like uh, JFK. Hmm. Um, This guy was probably deliberately done, as you know, um, probably know, um, Gore Vidal was distantly related to the Kennedys uh, through um, Jackie. I don't think I knew that. Yeah, um, he was like a second cousin to Jackie's cousin, the uh, Ocean Clauses. I can never pronounce oh, that name. Oh, sure. Okay. And apparently, and he ran for um, Congress in 1960 right. and lost. And apparently the Kennedys didn't help him much. They, they <laughs> snubbed him. So that's just a piece of trivia because snubbed him because Gore Vidal was gay and he was pretty open about it even in the 60s, in, sure. during the 1960s. Anyway, both candidates are trying to get the endorsement of of former president Art Hochstetter, who's modeled after Harry Truman. This is a film about mudslinging. Uh, Russell's skeletons include having a nervous breakdown and being hospitalized for it, plus having a series of extramarital affairs. Cantwell's uh, skeletons, including being part of a homosexual group in the army, that all that were court-martialed except for him. Once again, very well cast. Henry Fonda as, as Russell and Cliff Robertson as Cantwell. And uh, Robertson played JFK PT in the previous year in PT-109. Uh, Margaret Layton plays Russell's rather cold wife and Edie Adams is Cantwell's coquettish one. Uh, Kevin McCarthy and Gene Raymond, Raymond play their respective campaign managers. And Southern shows up briefly as a committee woman, described as Russell as the only known link between the, the Ku Klux Klan and the NAACP. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But the, but the best performance in this film comes from Lee Tracy as Hofstetter. And he's the only actor from the uh, Broadway play to repeat his performance. He looks like a wheelie dealer and he breathes politics. One of my favorite lines from the film and the play is, there's nothing like a good low down political fight to bring the roses into your cheeks. Tracy, uh, Lee Tracy was a big actor in the 30s. In the 30s, sure, I thought. Yeah, the front page, he was Hildy Johnson and Dinner at Eight. But in the late 40s and 50s, he only appeared in television hmm. in Siri in a couple of series that I never even heard of. And uh, The Best Man is his only movie from 1947 to his death in 1968. He did get an Oscar nomination for Supporting Actor, and he definitely, definitely deserved it. The, the only disappointment in the film for me was the performance from Shelley Berman, uh, who plays an insurance salesman he, who is the one who accuses Cantwell of his life as a gay soldier. In the movie, it's referred to as a, a degenerate. Uh-huh. Yeah. As an actor, 
Berman is a good comedian, but this role required a lot more, and he just didn't have it. Yeah, it's odd casting. Hmm? Yeah. Odd casting. Yeah, I don't know why they cast Sometimes him. casting a comedian in the straight role works, a la Robin Williams. Yeah, it just didn't Sometimes work here. I li and I liked Shelley Berman. I, I really liked him on uh, Larry David's show. Haskell Wexler is the black and white cinematographer. Hurrah! And this time I was watching it. It was on Turner Classic just a couple nights ago, even though I have a copy of it. I noticed there were shots where you really, really see every line, every crevice of both uh, Fonda and Robertson. It's like they weren't trying to, I got a feeling they weren't using makeup. I, I'm not sure, but you really saw in both of them and Lee Tracy, the wear and tear of politics. <laughs> um, the, the last thing I want to mention is there's a, Another uh, person running for president in this group named C.C. Claypool. He's the governor of Texas. And he's played by John Henry Falk. And John Henry Falk, I don't know if you guys I don't know, know him. Who, he was a radio broadcaster who was blacklisted and right. he successfully sued this uh, gr uh, grocery chain for blacklisting him on his radio program. He didn't get that much money, um, but there, there was a TV movie about it with George C. Scott and William Devane. Yeah, I remember that. It was good. Yeah, and I was trying to look up the title and I can't find it. But he plays, it's just kind of a, a to the front, which, which made me think of it. Right. Uh, and it's a small part, and he's described, his character is described as a, uh, by Henry Fonda as uh, he has all the qualities of a dog except loyalty. I, I love Fonda in it, I think he's great. I think Fonda is, is brilliant in it. I, I've seen, uh, twice I've seen the play, uh, God, Spalding Gray played it the first time. Wow. Spalding Gray is not an actor. And he was terrible in it. Yeah. And then uh, John Larroquette played him. Uh, a few years later, and he was actually pretty good, but not as good as Fonda. No, and, and I think it's the best work I've ever seen of Robertson, who admittedly I'm not a fan of. I but, love the um, uh, you know we the, the photography, as you mentioned, is is beautiful, and I want to turn our listeners back to our second episode, which is about that early '60s black and white and yeah. sharp, and how detailed it looks. Like we didn't include Schaffner in that in that episode, but we probably should because it is a beautiful looking film too. And it didn't really is. Dialogue is Gore Vidal, so it's gonna be snappy. Also, one of the reasons I prefer the movie to the play is it's shorter. I think some of, um, some of the play gets a little bit of kind of windy and the play cuts, cuts that yeah, out. Yeah, a little preachy, a little preachy. Yeah, preachy and windy and yeah. Well, and that's the problem yeah. with, with political films in general, serious political films, is that they mm -hmm. tend to, you know, even Aaron Sorkin, I don't know if you guys have seen Trial of the Chicago 7 yet, but Not yet. I, it, uh, on, on Netflix, it's, it's excellent. Is but, it? Oh, good. Um, well written, because it's Aaron Sorkin, not well directed, because it's Aaron Sorkin. Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> yeah, probably should not have directed his own material, but the performances are great, but, you know, in the same way, I'm going to, you know, and if like a film like Network, I mean, Network is just brilliant and way ahead of its time, but- Oh my God, yeah. But there's no real people and it's just people making brilliant Patty Chayefsky speeches at each other. I don't know. I think definitely the Holden character is not a, is a definite character uh, person. I, I would disagree with you on that. All right, I, mm. I will, I, I listen, I, lo I, I love the movie, but uh, it's, well, we're gonna have to talk about that special preview for our next episode, because I'm sure that's gonna come up. Oh, I'm yeah. sure you're oh, not gonna great. be happy that, it, that it's off the to Rocky for, uh, for oh, Mid no. Picture in 76. Our next episode's gonna be our alternate Oscars for the 70s. So uh, settle down, it's gonna be a while. That's gonna be probably our longest episode ever. <laughs> Cause my guy- We're guys, talking days. My guy. <laughs> Big 70s fan, and Mikey's, <laughs> Mikey's insisting Days. on foreign films. So yeah, settle in, hunker down, get you know, be comfortable, and you're gonna love that one. So anyway, my, my man, 
If you haven't seen it, go see it. Absolutely. It's, it's terrific movie. I think, I think that the, the Cliff Robertson character is sort of like a little amalgam of Bobby Kennedy and Nixon. And Joe McCarthy. And McCarthy. Because and of Joe the, McCarthy, yeah. Well, that's who Bobby yeah. Kennedy started working for. Let's, yeah. yeah. People don't want yeah. to remember that, but that's... Because Bobby Kennedy went through a real arc, a real change. Absolutely. He, you know, he... As, as he matured and also just how he learned more about what was going on in the world. Yeah. And of course, it's so interesting, and we're talking about political connections, that you was always associate Roy Cohn with McCarthyism. And we talked about, you know, the front and, and all the people who've been blacklisted that keep showing up in this episode. And who was his last, his last protege was Donald Trump. Uh, yep, yeah. Roy Cohn made Trump the man who he is. So has one man done more damage to this country in a lifetime than Roy Cohn? I don't know. <laughs> Donald Trump. Yeah, well, he learned well at the feet of the master. So my, I'm, I'm, it's interesting that my three, two, and one films are all directed by immigrants, people who were not born here and who came here as older children or even as adults. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it sometimes takes an outsider to clearly see what's happening on the inside. And so my third film is Billy Wilder's Ace in the Hole, which of course was a terrible failure when it came out. I sold about five tickets. It I think it was just too far ahead of its time because as you mentioned before, Mike, when I showed this to my, my teenage audience at Brooklyn Academy of Music, they loved it. They were like, when was this made? I mean, 1951. And boy, if Sunset Boulevard, which Wilder made the year before, is written in acid, this is drowned in acid. This is <laughs> cynical to the point of nihilism. But on the other hand, the points that Wilder scores here are, are very solid for those of you who haven't seen it. And that's another film that has been recovered and is now considered among not just Wilder's masterpieces, not just one of Kirk Douglas's greatest performances, but as a fundamental American film. It's about a reporter who is so obnoxious that he basically gets exiled from New York. No one will hire him. He ends up in Albuquerque and he's joins the newspaper there for nothing and desperately wants a story that's going to get him back to New York. And nearby, they're headed to, he and his young partner there are headed to a rattlesnake hunt or some little thing. And he hears about a guy who was souvenir hunting for Indian souvenirs in the cave he was hunting and has collapsed on him. And he's trapped there. And to make a very long story short, what the reporter does is he sees this as his opportunity to get back to New York. And so he contrives through bluff and threat and bribery to keep him there longer and longer, even though it may cost the guy who's buried his life, so that he can milk the story, he can turn it into this national sensation and get himself back to New York in style. It's a cynical premise. It's based, <laughs> to say the least. You and, think? Well, it's based on the, they made a musical out of it, the Floyd Collins yes. story, right? And it's, mm -hmm. so, so it's that story. And again, like Kane, not a very positive portrayal of the media, nor will that be in, mm -hmm. my, in my next film. And, you know, Douglas may not even be the worst character in the film as the reporter, Jan Sterling, who plays the trapped man. Oh my wife, God. Is horrible. She's, she's, she's so good in it. She, uh, what, yeah, why didn't she act more, My, What's her story? She Mike? did act, but she didn't get the chance to do major movies. She mostly was relegated, relegated to she, B movies. I've only seen her in one other movie, and it was almost the same part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, boy, she she is just horrible. She's but just, but she, the thing she, is, too, that the, what the Kirk Douglas character does, it works. Yes, yeah. well, that's what I was going to say, because when the, when, when the film was released initially as Ace in the Hole, you know, a, a very clever Wilder title, uh, it didn't go anywhere. They re-released it later on that year as the big carnival, right? Because right. what happens is, and this is where it gets political for me, not so much about Douglas and, and uh, you know, showing how opportunistic the media will be. That's an old story. But people drive by and they see stuff going on and they start to gather. People who are going on vacation drive their campers up. People put up tents. It becomes 
a whole thing. It becomes literally a carnival. Vendors come, they're selling Leo Minosa, the guy who's trapped in the cave. They're saying, Leo, Le you know, save Leo buttons and making a ton of money off of it. And they literally open a little amusement park because the crowd has gotten so big. Did you guys notice that one of the guys they interview says he works for the Pacific All Risk Company? Well, I caught that yeah. the last time, which is, of course, is Walter Neff's uh, company in Dublin yes. City, right? Pacific yes. All Risk. Check it out next time. But well, you know, there's the one character who um, who's traveling with his family, and they sort of come upon you know the whole gathering thing just by chance, and there's like, oh, well, let's go see what's going on, and then they interview him, and he starts turning interview and trying to promote himself as an insurance agent. Right, exactly, and and so the the again, I'm maybe being a little too English teacher here, but the message of the film is that success in an American style capitalist society and in our media is fundamentally, for lack of a more complex phrase, built on the suffering and death. Spoiler alert of uh, of others, as well as you know those willing to pay just be a part of the spectacle. Uh, it's, it's, it's a visionary film. And yet, as always with Wilder, very sharp, very funny. But boy, it is a surgical cutting up of, of the American character. Uh, the, film did, the film did no business. No. Yeah, yeah it bombed. It, to me, just like Kane and, and also Make Way Tomorrow, but for Tomorrow, my other films and my next two, of course, it kind of holds this mirror up to us. It's not saying that America is evil, but it is showing that we are in denial of this very dark side of ourselves as a society. And we ignore that side of ourselves at, an, at, at our own risk and that people will keep suffering and dying so that other people can make a fortune. And well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave the audience to draw the connections between then and today for yourselves, because I think they're pretty obvious. Yeah, I think that's sort of like what our election has become about, about right now. It's, it's, we're, choosing, we're choosing a path. We want to take the path towards lightness or towards darkness. Jedi or Sith. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. So, if you have it, it's now much more readily available than it used to be. It has been restored to its proper place in the Pantheon. Billy Wilder, Ace in the Hole, 1951. It shows pretty often now. Yeah, yeah. but it, didn't, it didn't used to. No. It, no. It, 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 I would definitely say it's Wilder's most underrated film. I'm going with Private Life of Sherlock Holmes on that one, but that's a whole, whole other episode. <laughs> well, I like that a lot, too. Love that. Um, all right. I just, I, just, I just prefer Ace in the Hole if I had to rank okay. them. Very different uh, intentions. Yeah. John, you're next. Ah, well, my next one, and uh, definitely related to Kane, is Nixon. 1995, directed by Oliver Stone, written by Oliver Stone, Christopher Wilkinson, and Stephen J. Ravel. I'm not exactly sure how to say that writer's name. Uh, it's been described as an epic uh i guess you can call it a historical epic drama i i you know it's an amalgam of a lot of different things uh based on the life and career of richard nixon and um it definitely has a lot to owe to citizen kane i'm sure that uh stone has watched citizen kane many many times but uh i think it's a great movie um a lot of images, there's a lot to, to absorb in this movie, but um, I, I think it's a very, very fulfilling film. And it has great performances. Oh uh, Anthony God. Hopkins, Joan Allen, Paul Sorvino, James Woods, J.T. Walsh, David Hyde Pierce, Mary Steenburgen, Ed Harris, Bob Hoskins, and Larry Hagman, and more people, and everybody's good in it. Anthony Hopkins is great in it. He is great. Joan Allen is Joan Allen she is She should great. have won the Academy Award, I thought, for that. Yeah, yeah. I Pat thought Nixon. I think he's I think he's brilliant in it. Hopkins? Yeah, well, he was up against Forrest Gump there, so yeah. when, when, No, I meant yeah. I meant Joan Allen. Oh Joan Allen, yeah. I thought she was gonna win for Nixon for supporting actress and Mira Savino got it instead. Oy, supposedly there's a story that supposedly uh Warren Beatty was someone that was considered to play Nixon. I don't see it, 
but uh, he read with he read with Stone and decided, you know, they decided against it. Apparently, Beatty wanted to make changes. Of course. <laughs> Not a surprise. But he read with Joan Allen. And Beatty said to Stone afterwards, he said, I think you found your, you know, your Mrs. Nixon. Yeah. It's funny, but, I just um, watched Bullworth again, talking about great political films. Uh, that, yeah, that's yeah. Beatty again. And, and but, let, us, uh, let us not forget E.G. Marshall and Madeline Kahn. That's right, E.G. Marshall Kahn and Martha uh, Mitchell. E. Marshall's excellent. <laughs> yes, and Madeline Kahn. <laughs> what a cast, my goodness. Oh. I know, it's an amazing cast, an amazing cast. And it's really, it's just sort of a mosaic, the way it kind of goes back and forth in, in different time periods, uh, revealing things about Nixon's childhood and his adolescence uh, when he was in college his career about how he, you know, how he changes. You see different aspects of him. He, he, you can see why he's a hard person to like. <laughs> yeah, but it's not altogether unsympathetic towards him. No, not at all, not at all. And, um, but I, because it's Nixon, I think that has a lot to do with why the movie bombed. It really did. It really did. And it not should have do, done much better than it didn't it did. do any business at all, even though critical reception was very, very, very good. Yeah, I think out. it's Stone's best film, easily. Uh, I do too. I agree. Yeah. Better than Platoon, gentlemen? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Wow. Platoon, I oh, even though I've seen guys. I've seen Platoon a few times and after you see it a few times, it's there really isn't any that much more to discover it in Nixon. I just keep seeing different things that each time I've seen it. It's and it's a very, it's, very rich film. I think it's the end of his great period, you know, from Salvador, to, you know, that 10 years from Salvador to Nixon. I mean, there are a couple of missteps, but boy, yeah, was, was after, there a better director in America for those 10 years? Because then after, after Nixon, there really is, none of the movies were really good. Right, Any Given Sunday, and then he, you know, this, he did the 9-11 thing and the W thing, and he's really kind of lost his way. The, the Wall Street sequel that nobody wanted. Oh, God. Yeah, that was right. Awful. He's really kind of lost his way. But yeah. John, I got a question for you. Have you yes. watched the part that was, that he cut with yes. Sam Waterston? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's kind of interesting. I can see why they didn't, he, he plays, um, who does he, the CIA? Helms. Helms, God. Yeah. I forget. Yeah. And I there's a reference to Helms in the movie it. that's very important. And I could see, yeah. Well, I think part of it too was time. Oh, it was over three hours as it was. Yeah. Right. So, but it, it's a really interesting scene. Um, I don't know if it would have made it a better movie if they included it. But uh, if you're going to watch the movie, try to seek out that scene that was cut. Yeah, it's on all the DVDs, I think. I think so. Yeah, it's on mine anyway. <laughs> but yeah, great movie. Yeah, and, and, and as I think, it, but also, but uh, Josh, I think it also goes back to what we were talking about before. You see these, I mean, really tragic scars that he endured as, as a child. Right. He's constantly referring to these things throughout his life and all the, I mean, he's become president and he's becoming a successful president and they don't make him feel any don't, better. Not enough. Still won't fill the hole. Yeah. yeah. No. We begin and to- he, and, he, and he does things, and he does things that are self-destructive. I mean, you know, remember guys being, being 10 years younger or so than you, my introduction to politics was Nixon resigning. I was nine years old when that happened. I remember watching it on television. That was my- what Happy childhood. Yeah, no, <laughs> oh, I, I've never, I've never grown up in a time where people at least sort of had some faith in their politicians, but that's coming later for me in my number one. Michael, what's that? Okay, if I were putting this as, you know, what is the best, the best of my five, this is my favorite, and it's The Candidate. From 1972, directed by Michael Ritchie, Problem. and the original screenplay by Jeremy Larner. And Larner is a, was a speechwriter for Eugene McCarthy. And he wrote this fictional film loosely, loosely based on Jerry Brown. I didn't know that. A politico named Marvin needs to find someone to run against California's senior senator, Republican Senator Crocker Jarman. God, I love that name. 
I know. It's such a great name. <laughs> Crocker John. <laughs> I'm signing I, I laugh whenever I hear it. There have been some good press over a legal aid lawyer named Bill McKay, whose estranged father was the governor, John McKay. Now, McKay hasn't even registered, has never registered to vote. And he's very skeptical about this whole idea from Marvin, who they went, they went to college together in Sanford, Stanford. But Marvin tells uh, McKay, look, you can say anything you want. You can run for the Senate, and you can say anything you want, and you will lose. So it doesn't really matter. And the, and the film is almost quasi-documentary. It focuses on how McKay starts out as an idealistic lawyer, running for an office that supposedly he cannot possibly win, and slowly compromises his position, his positions to the point where he's on the same stage with a teamster leader that he can't stand. And this is sort of a cousin, the State of the Union, because it's right. the Lansbury character is trying to do with Tracy trying to make him bland, uh, homogenize him. Anyway, he, has to, he brings his loath father to announce that he's uh, supporting, he's not supporting uh, incumbent Jarman, and he doesn't want his father to have anything to do with the campaign. That is one of the most fascinating aspects of the film, and you don't see much of, of the father, is the relationship between the son, um, McKay, and his father, John McCain, the older politician. Um, and then, much to his horror, he wins. And that one of the great last. And he has that wonderful last line he says to Marvin, What do we do now? <laughs> one of the best I, I, last I lines love, ever. I love this movie so much. Um, most of the actors are unknown, and that helps with the documentary feel of the film. But there are five five lead roles that are just superbly cast. Don Porter plays Crocker Jarman, the charm oozing out of him, but yet you know he's not he's a good great. person. He's great. He's just perfect for him. Uh, Peter Boyle, this is only his second major movie. This came out, the, uh, I think, two Joe. years after Joe. Right. And, and he, he's just this manipulative uh, uh, campaign chairman you know he's always saying you can do what you want but then well maybe not maybe maybe you, you don't want to lose too badly <laughs> you know and, and he just manipulates the guy and uh, then there's alan garfield who plays the uh, head of the um media he, he films his commercials and of course the one commercial that mckay wants to use you can't use them because uh, He's being drowned out by babies, even though that's the one where he's, which McKay feels he's sane the most. And then, God love him, Melvin Douglas, as, as, as McKay's father, um, he's just perfect for the role. Now, now, Douglas, I don't know, I know John knows this, I don't know if Josh knows this. Douglas has a link to politics. His wife, Helen G Helen Hagen Douglas. Sure, you know this, Helen G Hagen Douglas, who Nick Nixon accused of being a communist. And right, she was a congresswoman from 1946 to 1950. She ran for the Senate, and her opponent was Richard Nixon. And he had these uh, sheets, uh, the Pink Lady, he called her, saying how she was a communist. Of course, she wasn't true. It wasn't true, and. Uh, pretty much ended her political career. And so, Douglas himself was blacklisted, wasn't he? Not really. He just didn't do movies a lot in the 40s. He, he, went, he was served in the war, I believe. And he did a lot of stage work and he, he came to TV and then he came back in the 60s, HUD and Billy Budd and HUD where he's uh, right. kind of returned and then he constantly worked. I don't think I've ever seen a Douglas performance I've disliked. Uh, to me, he makes the notch go. Love him in the notch. Uh, you know, I just love everything he does. He's great in this. But the reason the candidate, I think, is as good as it is, is because of Robert Redford's absolute superb performance as Bill McKay. I, I, I don't think I've ever liked him more than I do in this film. He never mugs. Of course, you know, Redford is not a mugger. 
but you can always tell what's ticking in him. Yeah. Just, just by whether he's, whether he's fighting with his media staff or he's fighting with his wife or he just reacts to the coldness of his father's overtures and his parents are divorced. Redford is just, it really, I, I, I'm amazed that he didn't get nominated for an Oscar for this because he's, he's just so good in it. And it was not a big hit. Did you no, it was an art film. Did you guys see HBO's uh, Watchmen series? Because in, no. that, in that universe, which is built on the gra- universe of the graphic novel, Robert Redford becomes president after Nixon and uh, becomes a, in real life, it becomes a powerful liberal president. It's interesting. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Better than Reagan anyway, if we're going to have an actor be president. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, Jeremy Lardner won the Academy Award for Best Division <laughs> Screenplay, and he only wrote two scripts in his life. The other one was Drive, he said, uh, which he adapted from his own novel. Yeah. Which I've never seen. Have you guys? Oh, yeah. No, it's a, it, a really good Nicholson. Uh, didn't he, Nicholson, Nicholson directed it? Directed it, his first. Yeah, I think it's. And first that Bruce Stern is supposed to have been really good in it. Yeah. Well, we, that's another, another episode we have to do. We have to do New Wave Hollywood beyond the Scorsese Coppola crew and look at some of the more obscure films from that period because there's a lot. Yeah, of I'd like to see Drive East Set. I've always heard good things about it and it's never around. Never, yeah. No, it's very good. So uh, for my number two, you know, Mike was talking about how the, uh, the radio interviewers sort of help fan the flames for this carnival that happens in Ace in the Hole that's built upon this poor guy's suffering and suffocating in the cave. Um, let's flash forward to six years after Ace in the Hole, and now we've added television into the mix. <laughs> and... We have talked a lot about Ilya Kazan in these uh, in these pages. You kind of have to, and sort of a mixed bag. But I think his masterpiece. Uh, you know, I know you guys love Streetcar. I love Streetcar too. I love Waterfront for what it is. But I think his masterpiece is Face in the Crowd from 1957. See if this sounds familiar, political fans. A huckster who is a complete charlatan, fraud, and snake oil salesman, through the power of the media, is able to reach a huge position of power. Huh, he said, scratching his head. Who does that sound like? I mean, facing the crowd, anticipated not only the rise of someone like Donald Trump, but also the importance that the media, especially the visual media like television, would play. And that's the difference between Ace and the Hole and um, a face in the crowd in those intervening six years, television had exploded and become a huge medium, the medium. And for those of you who don't know the story, it's about, it's talk about unusual casting. Uh, it's, uh, it's central character is played by Andy Griffith. You know, the most benign, you know, from the Andy Griffith show to Matlock, you know, the most lovable and beloved character. But he plays this sort of, you know, Huckster character named Lonesome Rhodes and Patricia Neal, who I we all adore. We're all big Patricia Neal fans here. Absolutely, is, is looking for a, for a story, and she finds him. And to make a very a, another very long story short, with his folksy wisdom and such, he sort of catapulted to fame, and he turns out to be a monster that she's created. That she cannot control and he's this close to advising the president into fascism when they're finally able she and uh her uh, walter matthau who's the other great performer in this is able to pull the plug on him or actually rather uh hot it's it's a hot mic kind of thing they leave the hot mic on him when he's talking about how much he actually despises the people and what idiots they are and what morons and how easily manipulated they are and she makes sure the mic how could that ever happen (laughs) exactly i mean and you know i don't i don't think it's a great technically directed film like some of Kazan's other work but when I've shown this to my students their attitude is always the same they say how did this get made in 1957 how did they know I mean of course it was written by Bud Bud Schulberg not surprisingly who is one of the smartest and most political writers and it does like Network again uh, get a little shrill with its politics but my god you know if I were doing this episode in 2015 before the rise of Trump, 
I might not have put this so high, but I, I think if you want an explanation of Donald Trump, take a face in the crowd, stir in social media, and boom, you have our 45th president. What do you guys, do you guys like the film as much as I do? Not quite as much, but I do like it. I, I, I would put I this- I like it, I, I'm, not, I'm not as crazy. Go ahead, go ahead, Michael. Oh, I, ahead. I would put this as second to Streetcar Named Desire. I do think Griffith is, is absolutely superb in it. I, I, right, if you only know Andy Griffith from his television work, you will be shocked, stunned, and- Yeah, amazed. I watched it recently. It's, it's on Turner Classic Movies. Uh, on demand this week, and I, I watched it a few days ago, part of it, and I, I found I had to turn it off because it's just it's, depressing it's me. Yeah, so and, much well, with what's going on. Yeah, I was, I was going to say it, it makes you about halfway through the movie, you kind of start to squirm because of what's going on now. Yeah. It, just, it makes you really uncomfortable. Um, I think and I didn't feel that way when I saw it in college. Yep. Yeah, I, I think everyone is really good. Tony yeah. Francios is very good. Yeah, he is good. He was a good actor. He just, yes. I don't know. Incredibly, you know, all of, uh, it is, is maybe not Kane so much, although it's ahead of its time in a different way. But in terms of the political, social political themes, all of these films are way, way, way ahead of their time. Yeah. And, and um, just a very impressive piece of work by, again, someone who, like Wilder and my number one, director of my number one film, who you probably guess who it is, uh, an immigrant, you know, someone who came from the outside and therefore I think had a much more clear eyed and balanced view of American society as opposed to say someone who was born here. Johnny, you're up. All the President's Men, nah, 1976, Rob, Rob again. directed by, direct, yeah, directed by Alan J. Pakula, written by William Goldman, Robert Redford, Dustin Hoffman, Jack Warden, Martin Balsam, Hal Holbrook, Jason Robards, and a great minor performance by Jane Alexander. She's, she's fantastic. She's yeah. excellent. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there anyone that hasn't seen this movie? <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of younger people who have not seen All the President's Men. I'm sure people under 30 haven't seen it, but. Under 40. Yeah, 40. Yeah, I, I think it's a movie that keeps getting better and better. It's really aged well. Uh, I just, I just love the attention to detail in the movie, and and everybody in it is excellent. And I love how it's it's very understated, and just bit by bit as they reveal information, discover new things, and it takes you along this journey. And in the end, it's very powerful. Uh, the photography is excellent. The, all, all the different aspects, the way it's edited, the set decoration, production design, just all the different elements coming together. And I mean, uh, Alan J. Pakula, a really underrated director. Yes, he was. He also did the parallax view, which would go into this. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I thought about including that, but my God, it's so paranoid and depressing. Yeah. <laughs> paranoid style, yep. Yeah. I have to be honest, I only saw Parallax View once. And that, I liked it, but it was just like, ew. Yeah, I know. I, I, I can understand why you would only want to see it once. But it's interesting. I think it compares so well to these recent expose movies like The Post and Spotlight. I, they're, those are movies are fine. I mean, Spotlight won Best Picture. But I, I don't think they even hold the candle to all the presidents, man. No. No. It doesn't. No. I think without All the President's Men, those movies wouldn't exist, but All the President's Men, I believe, is the only truly big political film that was a box office hit, and it was an enormous hit. Yes. Yeah. I don't even think The Post was. I, I, I'm not sure. But I don't even no, think I, the, uh, what, what, what's I think, Go ahead. I think The Post did okay. Okay. But it wasn't like a, all the president's men was like a blockbuster hit. Everybody right. saw it. Yeah. It was like the Godfather. 
Yeah. I think what I like, what I like about all the president's men on this list is that, you know, especially in the films that I've been talking about, the media is portrayed in a very harsh and negative light, not inappropriately, but in like, a, you know, Ace in the Hole and, fa and Face in the Crowd, and even to some extent in Kane. This is one time where we get, where the, where the press of the heroes, where they do yeah. what they're supposed to do and yeah. serve the best interest yeah. and, you know, I have Stone's quote that uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant, and uh, that's that's Hoffman, and that, that's Woodward and Bernstein, that's Hoffman and Redford in this film. I should also yeah. put a, a shout out to the whoever did the casting because even the smallest parts are are well casted. You know, Stephen Collins uh, shows up. Um, yes, uh, John McMartin has one little scene. Penny Fuller. Uh, Lindsay Krauss. I mean, yeah. it, it's so well cast with with yeah. some of the really the best yeah, stage and film actors at that time, and not just you know not just the leads. It, it's it's yeah. so good. <laughs> Bacula, Alan J. Pakula was very Alan J. Pakula was very good with actors. Very yes, good. he was. And, and you know, and originally, because uh, Redford was, it was originally it was Redford's idea to make the movie his production company. Yeah, he, wanted, he had. Uh, yeah, he had originally envisioned this a smaller movie with lesser known actors, but to get the money and everything, the the student right. the Warner Brothers was saying pretty much put pressure on and said you're going to be in it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he eventually agreed, and then they started casting bigger names in it. And it's supposedly they originally considered Al Pacino for. Uh, the Bernstein, Bernstein role, and then decided on, uh, on, yeah, and then decided on Dustin Hoffman. Just thought he was a better fit. I can't. Yeah, Hoffman's anyone, great in it. Yeah, I can't imagine anyone else in those parts. No, I, I can't mean, just either. Just talking I about it makes me want to put it on. Exactly. All right, so guys, before we get to our number ones, uh, we have uh, each of us has five quick runners up. So uh, you get to read your list now, Mikey. What's your six through ten? Oh well, you know this is. Uh, Boy, there's so many. Uh, I, I had all the President's Men and uh, Bullworth and, and Nixon on as honorable mentions, but they're not. They're all great movies, and I would might have put them on the list if John hadn't. Uh, Election. Is on mine, too. A movie that I, I think is improved from when I first saw it. I, I first saw it, and I was a little like, what exactly is this? And I've since watched it on, uh, on cable, and I like it. I like it a lot. And one of my all time favorites, and I mention it on every other podcast, Nashville. Oh boy. Yep. Well, I have a feeling Nashville's going to come up in your alternate Oscars of the 70s episode. I just have this. Yeah, I think. <laughs> just, just throwing it out there. <laughs> just guessing. It's a possibility. It could happen. But uh, Nashville, I, would, I think, is Robert Altman's probably most overtly political film. Yes. Uh, yes. with his use of uh, the third party and how the campaign person manipulates all of these performers uh, to perform at, at, a, at a rally for, uh, for him and they don't know anything about him. <laughs> and uh, we never even see the guy. We, we hear his voice all throughout the movie, but I, I would uh, definitely Nashville is, is... Yeah. Although in some senses, a lot of what Altman did... Uh, yeah. Before, I mean, MASH is certainly a political film and it's... Yeah, MASH is also... MASH, uh, Nashville, I think, is his best film. I would find it hard to argue with that. Yeah. It's so, so, certainly the most Altman-esque Altman film. Right. <laughs> Although I know, uh, I know people... I, I lent it to the director of the movie that I, uh, I did some time ago. And he said he liked Altman, but he did not like Nashville. Interesting. I, you know, maybe it's it's a piece of its time. I, have you ever shown it to your students, Josh? Just scenes. Just, just, just scenes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder if, if younger people uh, would appreciate it. All right, so, and very quickly, my six through 10 are uh, Manchurian Candidate, which oh. speaks for itself. Please Not the Remake, the 1962. Um, Grapes of Wrath, uh, which is, is shocking to me only in the fact that it's a John Ford film. And I always think of John Ford as being, you know, conservative, not radical conservative, but conservative. And yet 
Grapes of Wrath is as powerful a liberal statement from Steinbeck uh, as you can get. Um, Bamboozled, which uh, we mentioned last week, last time in our episode about uh, lesser known films by African-American directors. Again, a film that falls apart at the end, but is as sharp a satire of race issues in this country as you'll ever see. And speaking of race issues, another film I mentioned in the last episode, The Spook Who Sat by the Door, Ivan Dixon's one film as a director from 73, about a, uh, the first African-American CIA agent who uses his training then to train the gangs in the inner cities to become a guerrilla army. And it's, as I said last time, it, there is nothing quite like it. And then my number, uh, my number 10 would be election. Uh, using, oh. using a high school election as a metaphor for a larger and darker view of society in general. Johnny, your runner's up. Uh, well, first I want to mention a couple of older movies that are not quite as well known. The Great McGinty, ah. Preston Sturges movie. Good great, great political satire movie. And you mentioned John Ford. I really like The Last Hurrah a lot uh, with Spencer Tracy. I think I've Tracy is it. excellent. Good, it's a good movie. I think Tracy's excellent in it. It's about yes, a, is. a mayor mayor in Boston running for re-election, and it deals with all the, the different kinds of things he needs to do to get re-elected, but also it's about the changing of time and how elections are covered with media and how he deals with that or doesn't deal with it. Uh, Wag the Dog. Love yeah. with, with De Niro and Hoffman, directed by Barry Levinson. And uh, Lincoln, which we've talked about before in another ep episode, so that's why I didn't pick it in my other movies to begin with. And then we get into that mode of the political thriller, and we've already mentioned The Manchurian Candidate and Seven Days in May, and we just talked about Parallax View, Three Days of the Condor. Oh, yeah. My. Yes, another great 70s paranoid political film. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and a, well, a paranoid political film that's unfortunately based in reality. Yep. Yes, indeed. About, about how the whole, all the oil companies have a lot of political influence. All right. Mm -hmm. So with that, let us head into our number ones. Michael, you're up. Well, this is really not my number one, but it's, it's, I started in 1948 and I'm ending I'm in 19, 1998. And that's Primary Colors, uh, directed by Mike Nichols, a screenplay by Elaine May based on the novel by Anonymous, AKA Joe Klein. Joe Klein, right. Yeah, the uh, New York uh, Magazine uh, columnist, best known for uh, proclaiming that Do the Right Thing was going to start race riots. And I, had, I did read the book and um, movie much, much, much better. It's a thinly disguised adaptation of the book by Anonymous, um, which concerns Jack Stanton, a uh, governor from a small southern state running for the Democratic nomination, and how far he gets despite getting into jams such as illicit affairs and arrest as a student protester. And this is seen through the eyes of Henry Burton, a young Afro-American lawyer who's the grandson of a great leader. I guess we're supposed to presume it was someone of the same ilk as uh, Martin Luther King. Unlike the book, the script by Lane May is witty Amen. and tends to be more even-handed against Clinton, sorry, than Stratton, uh, showing him what makes him tick. The book was really mean-spirited. It was a, you read it, either one of you read it? Oh yeah, I, I, haven't, read it. Came out. I haven't read it. Oh, well, you haven't missed much, John. <laughs> Don't bother. I thought the book was mean spirited. Yeah, it was kind it was of just trashy. Like, yeah. It was just like, I want to get at Clinton, and but this is the only way I can. Even though, you know, Klein was ostensibly a liberal you know, Democrat, but, but where, where the book was me, and he cuts out things like an affair between um, um, Mrs. Clinton, or Mrs. Stanton, and, the, and Henry. That's cut out of the book, and, 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 and it's cut out of the movie. In the book, it was just like, oh, God, really? You're throwing everything at, at this. I, I, I managed to finish the book, but I really hated it. It was one of the, <laughs> because it just got me so angry, you know. And Anyway, superb acting. John Travolta looks like Clinton. 
Uh, and he, he, I think it's actually one of his, along with Pulp Fiction, possibly one of his two best performances. He's really good in it. Emma Thompson is, is very good. She has a passable American accent, Miss Hillary. Uh, the British stage actor, Adrian Lester, uh, and he has an excellent American ac accent. I was wondering, who is this guy? And then I looked him up and he's British. Billy Bob Thornton, oh, and he's in almost every scene because he's the books, in the, in the book, he's the narrator. Right. Um, Billy Bob Thornton is James Carville. Talk about perfect casting. I mean, <laughs> he resembles him, my God. Um, in smaller roles, uh, Diane Ladd, Moira Tierney, Robert Klein, Rob Reiner as the host of a Florida radio show called Smooze with Jews. <laughs> it's one of the funniest Perfect. bits in the movie. And I, you, I don't even remember that from the book. I, I got a feeling that was all Elaine May. Uh, Larry Hagman, Tony Shalhoub, Caroline Aaron, and best of all, Kathy Bates. Oh. as uh, Libby, the former chief of, Stat of staff of Stanton's, who's described her herself as a gay lesbian out of the loony bin. And she's a fixer for all of Stanton misdeeds. She's equally funny and she's frankly heartbreaking. I mean, it is a comedy, but in the last 45 minutes, there's nothing funny in the film. It's actually very sad. Yeah, no, it's, hard. it's a good balance of, of the dramatic. Yeah. Movie. Absolutely. And um, it, to me, it's just one of the greatest examples of a movie so, so far superior to the book. Hmm. Um, when you uh, said 1998, I thought you were going to say Bulworth. That's John's. Ah, good. <laughs> All right. A little foreshadowing. There. I love Bulworth, but John gave me the candidate and I gave him Bulworth. <laughs> oh, all right. So you guys worked this at the, all right. See, yeah, we worked, it's, we it's worked it out. We didn't want to spend on. a lot of time talking about the same movie. It's stuff that goes on behind. And me. Primary Colors is not in the same league as Bulworth. It just isn't. No, but it's a, it's, I like Primary Colors a lot. I, it's, and it it's, I think it's a really good example, though, of a political movie that's very entertaining. Because I think I think a lot of people think of political movies and they think, oh God, like, you know, they don't want to be preached to or it's right. gonna be like really heavy handed and you know, I don't wanna I don't wanna bother or it's gonna be depressing. But at primary college is very entertaining. But once again, not a successful film. It did not do well. No, no it did not do it well. It didn't help it came out in the same year that Clinton got really did get into trouble. So uh, my my number one um, my number three was directed by an immigrant from Germany. My number two was directed by an, a Greek immigrant from, by way of Constantinople. And my number one is directed by a Polish director. And that, of course, could only be oh. Chinatown. Yeah. And Chinatown is sort of the ultimate expression. We've mentioned all these films like The Candidate, Parallax View. I'd throw the conversation. I'd even extend a little forward and throw Blowout by De Palma in there, which I like more than you guys. And it is the ultimate film of the paranoid style. Because, and it's, to me, it's number one, probably just because of a, a, a bit of lucky timing. Remember, it comes out exactly two months before Nixon resigns in 74. It's a film about not being able to trust the institutions and authorities around us because they're all controlled by people that we will never know and that we will never see. And what do we get two months later? Our president resigning in disgrace. So the corruption, the cracks in the society made manifest by Nixon and his, the end of his presidency are a fundamental part of what Chinatown is about. And it's so much more. I mean, because look, the nation is founded on the idea of duly elected officials carrying out the will of the people and trying to make the country a better place to live. But ever since the beginning, since before the beginning, there have been these people who've operated in the shadows. If you've ever read uh, Jane Meyer's book, Dark Money, about the Koch brothers, that's the modern example of that. Yeah. But Trump is sort of the antithesis of that because he's very public in his desire to control. But the real power lies in the Noah Crosses of the world. John Huston's character in, in Chinatown may be among the most, in a social way, terrifying 
because yeah. he's very quiet. He's never seen. He's never heard, but his tentacles are everywhere. And so, you know, for example, when, when, when Evelyn, when Faye Dunaway says, you know, when Jack Nicholson says to her, why don't you call the police? Her answer is he owns the police. And that's something that is very hard for Americans to, we can't believe that everything, the institutions and the people we trust, everything that whole system is built on is actually just a facade for the very quiet, very powerful puppet masters that we will never ever see, but who actually have much more control over our lives and our destinies than we'd ever want to know or feel comfortable with. And you talk about great last lines as we did in The Candidate. There's a reason that Chinatown's last line resonates so much because Chinatown resonates as a symbol for all of that hidden power all the people behind the people who are really running things and everything is, and, and we're, 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 the, we're the innocents wandering about, you know, we're, we're, we're Evelyn, we're Catherine, the daughter slash granddaughter and Giddy's as well, because, you know, for all his smug streetwise talk, you know, Giddy's believes that, that, you know, right can triumph and he can solve the crime and make, make things work and make things right. And, it's forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. You're never going to you're never going to get past that. And your life as an American is totally dominated by the Noah crosses of the world, and you don't even know they're out there. And boy, was that a disturbing thing. And of course, the other thing I like about it is that it fits in perfectly with Polanski's you know, ideal, which he, you know, earned honestly as a Holocaust survivor, as, you know, with a Manson thing. But, you know, in Polanski's films, evil always triumphs. Always. In Rosemary's yeah. Baby, in Death and the Maiden. I mean, even in, even in The Pianist, where, yes, Spielman lives, but the German who, sold, the German who saves him, we, the last shot we see of him is dying in a Russian prison camp. Evil always wins and good stands by helplessly. And that we can do a whole we can do a whole episode on Chinatown just as we could on Citizen Kane or some yeah. of the other movies we've talked we've talked about, but it's a flawless movie. It's and, just so and, good. Yep, and I think like the other films I've mentioned, it holds a mirror up to us in an effort to make us very uncomfortable, to not let us be smug about our society. You know, to me, I don't know how you guys feel about JFK. And there are problems with it, but there, are, but that moment when uh, Kevin Costner as Garrison is delivering the speech to the jury, and Stone kind of zooms in on him, and Costner points to the camera and says, "It's up to you." And what I love about JFK is that really the message of JFK is not is not who killed Kennedy. The question is that we have let our government and those forces control us when our country was designed to be the other way around. We're supposed to control our government. And so it's Stone through Garrison saying to us, take your country back. And I leave you with my, the top of my list with that thought as we head into election day. We're recording this on Friday the 30th, so it's four days away. So if we get this out by election day, take, this in, take, take your country's fate into your hands. Right, because otherwise the Noah crosses of the world will always win. Johnny? Well, I think that's a good segue into my number one, uh, Bullworth. Yo, boy. 1998, directed by Warren Beatty, written by Beatty and Jeremy Pixter, with Warren Beatty, Halle Berry, Oliver Platt, Don Cheadle, Paul Sorvino, Jack Warden, and a lot more people. Everyone is excellent in it. Um, the premise is that a U.S. senator from California, he's, let's just say his politics have gone out of fashion and he's become very depressed and he decides he's going to commit suicide. Only the way he does it is that he hires a hitman <laughs> to kill him. Right. <laughs> and he, 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 buys, he buys a ton of insurance right. so that his daughter will get, will get the money when he's killed. And knowing the fact that he's going to die also sort of takes the, the shackles off him. He can say whatever he wants now when he goes on a campaign speech and he starts saying all these things in front of an audience. And afterwards, he feels great and he keeps doing it. 
and he suddenly becomes, he starts to become a media sensation and realizes he has his power to just speak his mind. And so part of the movie is about him trying to make sure he can get the, as he calls it, the weekend project, get the hitman uh, called off. Weekend research project, yep. The research, uh, <laughs> the research project. <laughs> and I can't think of many other movies that are so consistently entertaining and funny and yet so serious at the same time. And it, and it all goes back to what you were just talking about before, about how the people, there are people being controlled or have controlled over the government that we have not elected. Right. And uh, Paul Sorvino's character, the Southern Paul Sorvino insurance. especially, is, is he's representative of all the insurance companies. Right. And it brings up issues about race relations and, and health care. And it's a great, great movie that unfortunately kind of bombed. Really bombed. It breaks uh, my it, heart how badly yeah, that it, did. Well, it, it made, I think, maybe just enough money to pay off what it took to make the movie. But, uh, did it, did it uh, make it that much even? Well. And it didn't, get a, it didn't get a lot of distribution either. No. It, uh, I know it only got Say one Oscar again. nomination for its screenplay. Right. And I, I, I thought it, was, I thought it yeah. was a brilliant movie. Yeah, uh, I, 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 you know, it, it, it sometimes it takes satire, you know, it's the, the idea of the sugar coated pill to teach a lesson, you know, you could, you could, you know, hit us over the head with it, or you can put it into the, you know, the comic terms that John is talking about. And the lesson goes down very well, Halle Berry's whole speech about why there are no great black leaders anymore. She said, well, maybe it's because they've got killed, but actually, and she goes into the whole thing yeah. about the socioeconomics of, yeah. uh, of, of the ghetto. The and manufacturing just, base right. and how it destroyed the lower income and middle income families. Right, how Don Cheadle says that, you know, yeah, you, you, you look down on me because I'm a drug dealer sending kids out as my army, but in Washington, you send kids to fight and die in Iraq and Afghanistan for what? So, yeah, points very well taken. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I just, I mean, if you haven't seen it, you got to see it. It's a great movie. Yeah, totally agree. And, you know, Beatty is someone who's made an entire career about being, by being a lot smarter than everyone thinks he is because he's such a pretty boy. Um, although my favorite Beatty film, Dick Tracy, but that's a whole other episode. I'm a huge fan of that. Well, I, I like Dick Tracy, but I think this, this is Beatty's best movie. And I think it's probably his best performance. Yes. And one of the things I really love, yes. really love about his performance in this is that here you have a very, you know, a famous established, you know, leading man type actor who's had a long career now and he's willing to make a complete ass out of himself in this movie and he's so good in it and funny although it's kind of ironic some you know critics who and i gotta i gotta give a shout out to the, to oliver platt yeah, i gotta give a shout great. out to oliver platt in this movie because he's he he is great in it and how really great, really great. It kind of made a star out of Halle Berry, who had, who had we've seen before, but this is her really her breakout part. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, though, ironically, that uh, some people looking back on the film have said, on the opposite end of the political spectrum, it anticipates Trump, someone who gains tremendous popularity by speaking his mind in an unfiltered way, even though his thoughts may be unpopular and offensive. And, you know, there are so many times where his staff is saying, oh, my God, Bullworth, you can't say that. And I'm sure Trump's people were saying, you can't say you're going to shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue. But but he does. I mean, just the opposite side of the spectrum. But there you go. So it's not surprising that uh, a few days before Trump is up for election that most of the films that we've talked about here are dark, if not cynical, you know, perhaps satiric, perhaps straightforward drama, portrayals of the American. I'm just going to say, if you want an antidote to all this, go to HBO and watch the, uh, the reenactment of the Hartsfield's Landing episode of uh, West Wing. All right, because when, whenever I get down about our political system, I watch, I watch West Wing and it makes me feel a little bit better, even though it's just a sort of a liberal fantasy. So if you haven't seen that, check it out. It's fabulous. Um, it's all the original cast, except for John Spencer, who passed away. So uh, speaking of passed away, how's that for a segue? Um, Mike, you're going to do our brief necrology this week? Yeah, very brief this time. Three actresses. Um, 
Conchetta Farrell, died at 77. She was best known uh, for the maid in Two and a Half Men on television. Right. Her films included Network, Edward Scissorhands, Aaron Brockovich, and most famously, the owner of Mystic Pizza. Yeah, she's fab. I love her in that. Yeah. And then there's Rhonda Fleming, who died in 97. And she was known, uh, along with Maureen O'Hara, as the queen of Technicolor hmm. because of her red hair and green eyes. Her film debut was Alfred Hitchcock's uh, Spellbound. And the other films included... Uh, what Canada. part does she have in Spellbound? Yeah, who can spell she that? was the patient in Bergman's patient in the beginning. Oh, I never made that connection. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, she's, it's just a very small part. She's uh, paranoid. She's yelling at Bergman, and Bergman's trying to be cool. It's, it's a brief scene, but that was her first credited uh, performance. Uh, other films included Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, sure. While the City Sleeps, Out of the Past, The Spiral Staircase, and Gunfight at the OK Corral. And then there was Marge Champion, who died at 101. Wow. And she was part of a dance duo with her husband, Gower Champion. They were featured in Showboat, Lovely to Look At, Give a Girl a Break. And I do remember her in a small part by herself in uh, Blake Edwards' The Party with Peter Sellers. Peter Sellers, yes, I remember that one. She also did the moves for animated characters, such as, and for Disney, such as Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, uh, the Blue Fairy and Pinocchio, and the Hippo Ballerinas in uh, <gasps> In Fantasia? Fantasia? What? That's my favorite scene in yep, any Yeah, she did the moves that they uh, did the animation. Actually, I, I saw um, uh, champion uh, in when I guess she was in her mid eighties on stage in uh, Stephen Sondheim's Follies in one of the revivals. And Perfect. She, you know, at 80, 84, whatever she was, she could still dance. All right, so a mercifully brief necrology there, and hopefully it will stay that way. Um, we are, as as I mentioned, we are headed into election season, so it goes without saying that if we get this out before election day, please vote. Our next episode, which will be coming in December, as mentioned will be our long-threatened alternate Oscars of the 70s. And I'm going to have to rein the, these guys in because I'm a 70s film fan, but these guys live for 70s films. So we're going to have some interesting discussions. And again, I, just looking at it briefly, I think maybe 72, as I said, was the only year they got it right with Godfather. So we're going to have some really interesting discussions yeah. on that one. So stay tuned and tune in. Um, as ever... Vintage Sand is a five nines and a four production. We want to thank Melissa Cabot for her technical help. Mama Sue for the space. Thanks for the use of the hall. And Gabby for her cool logo. Remember that we are on Spotify now, as well as Apple Podcasts and SoundCloud. Please check out our website at www.vintagesand.com and leave us your feedback and suggestions. And we say happy watching. Wash your hands. Stay indoors, please. And... Hopefully, when you're staying indoors, you will be watching where your favorite films will always be streaming. No Halloween parties. <laughs> <laughs>